All right, good morning again. Thank you for returning from the break so promptly. My name is Robert Adams, and I am currently the, the serving as the supervisor for the Weatherization Assistance Program for the U.S. Department of Energy. I've had the privilege of working with the Weatherization Program for more than 30 years in several capacities, from a trainer, a monitor, a program advocate in Washington, D.C., and now as a pro in program management at the department. I've seen this program transform from the simple delivery of storm windows and attic insulation to the highly technical science-based delivery mechanisms we see today. I've seen energy auditing transform from question and answer walkthrough to a site-specific audit, computerized modeling that accounts for interactive measures and calculates ener energy reductions and savings to investment ratios for each home instantaneously. Throughout these changes, the one constant has been the goal to provide families we serve with the most cost-effective energy efficiency measures and we can that are, that are at our disposal at the time that we are serving them. The WAP, with this longevity of service and consistency, has been able to serve the greater energy efficiency industry as a proving ground and market outlet for new ideas, materials, technologies, and installation protocols. The WAP is the largest scale user of blower doors at this time, and this market pull has led the broader range of equipment options, lower priced doors, and creation of a diversity of, pr of private companies offering these services. In the late 1980s, thermal imaging and other diagnostic procedures, such as pressure balancing and zone diagnostics, began uh, to be used widely by the weatherization program throughout the country. The use of infrared imaging helped improve our work in shell retrofit in and, and improve our quality for attic and sidewall insulation. The WAP leads the nation in lead safe techniques for energy efficiency workers and its Weatherization Plus initiative will lead the way in integrating advanced health and safety techniques with energy conservation and improve the indoor air quality and efficiency of the homes we serve. The program is currently developing guidelines for the home energy professionals as a way to standardize the various aspects of the work that we provide and, and to help uh, train our, our workers with, with new skills and, and knowledge and abilities to be able to provide a consistent and high quality service all the time. The previous panel helped us quantify the ec economic impact of the weatherization program to companies, communities, states, and the nation. The more than 10,000 vendors who receive funds to su help supply the program with goods and services and to the more than 25,000 highly skilled staff at all levels of the service delivery network the weatherization program has made a real difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of families and tens of thousands of us who work with it every day. The weatherization technology advancement panel that we have with us today will use the next 30 minutes or so to tell you about the improvements being made in both the measures we provide, the way we manage our, our resources, and the way, we, the way we hope to be able to improve the quality of our services for years and years to come. Um, I, I, would like to, I would like to uh, introduce quickly the gentlemen that are going to be, and ladies that are going to be speaking to you, and then each one of them at a, at a time will come up to the podium and make their comments. The first I'd like to introduce is Steve Payne. Steve and I have worked for, together for a long time. He now, he's worked in the program since the 1980s and currently serves as a managing director for housing improvements and preservation for the Washington State Department of Housing, Com Com Community Service, and Housing. Second, the second speaker will be Mark Jackson, and Mark's the Executive Director of the New River Center for Energy Research and Technology in Christianburg, Virginia. This is one of our 40 uh, facilities that is supported by the weatherization program to provide training to the workforce in both basic and advanced weatherization techniques. After that will be Frank Spivak. Frank is the Marketing and Sales Manager for Energy Conservatory in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They are the manu manufacturer of the Minneapolis blower door and one of the vendors who we rely on heavily for uh, providing us quality equipment in the program. After that is Brett Monroe. Brett is the president of Monroe Infrared Technology in Kennebunk, Maine. And their company builds the, the thermal imaging machines and they're used around the country to help us analyze homes and improve our work quality. And finally, Marcy DeFries. Marcy is the Director of Strategic Re Relations for Hawkeye Construction in Maryland, where she develops strategic business partnerships and markets the company. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming the panel today. And our first speaker, Steve Payne. 
Good morning, everybody. It's certainly a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate you all joining us. I see many familiar faces and many new ones for me. And uh, the first panel and the second panel that we're going to hear, you know, we spent a considerable amount of time trying to hear the stories about the people who this program directly serves, the low-income household. Uh, it's really been terrific um, today hearing the stories about the businesses that are helping us do that. Obviously, weatherization creates jobs, but many may not realize just how deep and how broad that is. There's certainly the hands-on labor and the construction. The program significantly impacts the indirect job market as well. The job market created by the material suppliers, uh, the product manufacturers, even the trainers whom weatherization depends upon. They're the supply chain uh, for our weatherization technology, and this panel that's next is going to help touch on that, both the training and the technology, the tools that we use. The weatherization program has been a technological breeding ground for over 25 years which enabled these suppliers to develop the cutting edge technologies that reduce energy costs for those homes that can least afford any inefficiency, as well as ensure that homes are healthy and safe. In so doing, these businesses are helping create the green technology jobs that our country needs to compete in the global energy economy. Today we're seeing tools and techniques, uh, techniques that were introduced into the program as standard practice nearly 20 years ago, if not more. And now we're seeing them gradually being integrated into the broader construction and retrofit industry. The weatherization program creates jobs in technology, manufacturing, supply, training, and construction. One day we'll look back and see that the first round of jobs creation was just the tip of the iceberg. Sometime in the future, we'll feel more than ever the impact of the new technologies that the weatherization program is developing today. As we deploy these new energy efficient technologies, not just in low income housing, but in every home throughout the country, will gain a substantial and crucial energy savings for our nation. Perhaps even more importantly, we'll build the sound foundation of a secure economic future for our country as we export new American technologies, goods, and services around the world. Today we're going to hear, and we have been, been hearing, from people contributing to this exciting new frontier they're ordinary American business people who are doing extraordinarily innovative things to homes to make them more energy efficient, health, and safe. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Jackson. I am with the New River Center for Energy Research and Training. We are one of the many weatherization training centers across the country. Before I begin today, I do want to say a special thank you to one of our biggest supporters and partners within the weatherization industry. It's actually the state of Virginia's Department of Housing and Community Development. They have really helped us with our success over the last couple of years. Uh, to get started today, we're actually going to watch a quick video clip. So uh, if you guys could watch the screen here. Center for Energy Research and Training, located in Christiansburg, Virginia, is a 12,600 square foot state-of-the-art training facility that has trained more than 25,000 weatherization workers since 1999. Our facility includes two training houses, 
grandma's house, and the mobile home lab. The main facility houses our many training labs and innovative props designed to give our learners practical experience in a controlled environment. Among these are the pressure house and Anthony Cox's house of pressure that demonstrate how a house works as a system. Our classrooms combine the latest technology and experienced instructors to create an engaging learning environment. Following their classroom experience, all of our students get guided, hands-on training to make sure that they leave our facility ready to practice what they have learned. We leverage smart boards, iPads, and other computer technologies to control our test houses and labs. This seamless integration of technology into the learning experience allows our gifted trainers to focus on teaching while letting the computers do the hard work. We are committed to creating the best online and blended learning solutions for our learners. Our development team works closely with our subject matter experts to create quality course content. We then add a layer of video interviews of our experienced trainers to add their insight, as well as video tutorials that show learners the right way to perform weatherization work. And last, but certainly not least, is our cutting edge 3D animation that enhances our interactive exercises and gives a unique view into the way the different parts of a house work together as a system. In addition to our training mission, we also offer multifamily energy auditing. Our talented multifamily energy auditing team includes many of our best and most experienced trainers, as well as leveraging the latest technology to bring energy and cost savings to more and more families. And when we're not training or performing energy audits, our team is traveling across the country giving presentations, hands-on field training, and mentoring to weatherization workers, energy auditors, crew leaders, and the general public. We also have deep roots in our local community dating back more than 30 years. We continue this tradition through our involvement in community outreach projects. At INSERT, our impressive facility, experienced trainers, Dedicated staff and cutting-edge technology come together to make us one of the best weatherization training centers in the country. All right, thank you. Um, hopefully that video actually represents not only INSERP, but again, one of the many weatherization training centers across the country. And I think we're about to queue up our presentation here. We'll wait just a moment for that. Interestingly enough, back in 2009, we had one full-time trainer on staff. We now have about 35 expert trainers, not only on staff, but contract trainers to deliver weatherization training and technical assistance. Uh, in the last decade, we've actually trained over 30,000 individuals across the United States and Canada. If you take a quick look inside, and a lot of you guys, of course, probably can't see this, but uh, the complimented insert is uh, multiple classrooms, lots of hands-on learning labs, including, of course, you saw the mobile home outside that we use which uses a lot of Lexan plastic in the floors and the ceilings, so actual trainees can see exactly what's happening as other trainees are blowing in insulation. So we've been pretty busy the last couple of years, you can imagine. We've actually uh, delivered about 515 classes at INSERT and touched almost 10,000 trainees since 2009. Where did all those, uh, all those trainees come from? Most of you folks know we actually added about 14,000 new jobs in weatherization in the last few years. Now, we know these are jobs that stayed right here at home. These were small local contractors, crew workers in the communities throughout the country that we served. Now, with that huge demand, we had to add another 26 training centers online to, to, to meet that demand. Now, what was the role of those training centers? It was to train and mentor core competencies and the essential knowledge, skills, and abilities for those job tasks. Well, at the same time that all that weatherization was going on, meeting those million homes, uh, training folks, um, the states were obviously were quite busy, the local agencies, uh, DOE and the Weatherization Assistance Program is uh, creating a lot of investments for the future. We're going to touch briefly on the uh, home energy professional certifications and the accreditation of weatherization training centers. So why credentialing of workers? We heard it a little bit before the importance of those skills that were transferable and portable between public and private sectors. A lot of our vendors, they were taking folks that were out of work folks that are straight out of school and giving them very marketable skills for the future. Uh, DOE actually targeted four specific classifications you can see listed here, the retrofit installer, crew leader, energy auditor, and quality control inspector. Well, next was accreditation. We've got to get folks trained. 
Well, we wanted to accredit weatherization training centers across the country to drive consistency and raise the bar nationally for training and retrofits. We hit an incredible milestone this last week. Um, I'm proud to announce that INSERT was actually the very first training center of the many to go through the accreditation process and be approved by IREC, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. Thank you. So what does it all mean? Uh, a trained and credentialed workforce will build healthier, safer, more durable, energy efficient homes. Provide a national standard of quality for the home performance and retrofit market. And most importantly, help, our le help lessen our dependence on foreign oil. So in conclusion, because I only had a few minutes today, what does that mean? It means having training centers out there that are accredited across the country, retention of jobs, retention of institutional knowledge accessible and consistent high quality training and a robust credentialed workforce for both weatherization and the residential retrofit industry. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a very distinct honor and pleasure to be here and, and most impressed with our first panel. Uh, the stories there are uh, some that I hope we all can share as we get back to our regular lives uh, back home. As was mentioned, I'm the uh, marketing and sales manager for the Energy Conservatory. We have uh, we've been in business since 1980, and probably in 1980, for many years after that, 100% of our business was to the weatherization community. Uh, Gary Nelson was an energy auditor before the word was even invented. Um, his work on thousands of homes in the uh, Minnesota area, looking at problems which in Minnesota, uh, ice damming and problems that relate to extreme cold, uh, were the result of air leakage. Air moving through the structure of the house, uh, causing defects and eventually figuring out that those defects could also be sealed and fixed that would save energy. He learned quite a bit about uh, the projects that took place at Princeton University, which is kind of the birthplace of the United States uh, blower door uh, industry. Uh, and in the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s, it's hard to believe, but at that time, there were as many as 13 manufacturers of blower doors. Uh, Model Zero, as it's kind of come to be known, uh, was born in 1980, and our current model uh, was born and uh, was developed in 1985. So that was 1980. I was uh, I joined in 1999, and I was only the ninth employee. So that's 20 years, and I'm number nine. Um, we when I started, we were still working out of an office and manufacturing facility that was a converted gas station. Um, but we had some dedicated people who were working there and uh, really thought that we could make an impact on, on the world. We moved to a new facility, which we thought was gigantic at 3,500 square feet. We were swimming with space. This was fabulous. But as uh, times changed, uh, the need for weatherization, uh, the impact of other things related to weatherization outside of the weatherization community, energy auditing, uh, the ResNet, and, and industries like that, we started to grow. In 2009, we were fortunate that we had contracted just prior uh, to the advent of ERA funding to add another 6,500 square feet of space uh, and added five new employees. So now we're up to 20 employees. So within a, a span of the first 20 years, we went from one to nine to now we're at, we're at 20. Uh, talented people that we have had money to train and get them involved in making some very complex, sophisticated equipment. Uh, and fortunately, we, we were able to add those people. It seemed miraculously at the right time because when February of, of uh, 2009 hit, it was just a madhouse. We still... Um, added requirements for our uh, building. We, uh, we added another 8,000 square feet. Um, we are 
fortunate to be part of the, the weatherization program. As I mentioned, we were 100 percent. Prior to 1970, we were probably 70 percent of our business was weatherization. ERA kept our company in business. Uh, certainly, it kept a lot of companies in business. Uh, but it was also one where we kept our suppliers in business. As the economy was ramping down, we needed more equipment and more supplies and material in order to make the equipment to supply to get into the air funding program. So we had our plastics manufacturers and our uh, aluminum fabricators. They were in the process of closing down for a week at a time or moving from a five day to a four day or a three day. We're desperate for material. We said we need, we need stuff. We can guarantee that you're going to get this amount of material from us. And many of them were able to add a shift back. So it does have the trickle down effect that we were, that I think all of us were hoping. Yes, it helped us, but it helped all of the companies and our local companies that are, 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 are our suppliers. And obviously this continued on until the middle of 2011. Uh, and during, certainly during, where there's, during the era funding process, we were at probably 90% of our business was weatherization. Presently for 2012, um, our sales are probably only about 5% over 2008. So we're still growing. But uh, the shift now is taking place into um, other aspects. We have more employees. We're trying to keep more of our, our keep our employees. We spent money on training new employees, and we want to keep them as as best as we can. But one of the other effects of uh, weatherization that maybe isn't necessarily talked about as much because there isn't that direct connection. But in 2009, or I should say 2008 for 2009, the International Energy Conservation Code recognized aspects of buildings that needed to be done, and this is all new construction. And part of the era funding was that states that took era funding were required to meet the uh, IECC 2009 standards, which required diagnostic testing and air sealing. 2012 version of IECC now requires all new homes to be air sealed for the building envelope as well as duct leakage testing. We see the effects in California with Title 24, where in the 2013 version, which was approved on May 31st, now requires duct sealing, has, duct, has required duct sealing for many years, but now requires air sealing of all new homes and testing and verification. When we talk about trying to get to net zero energy buildings uh, with ASHRAE and, and other organizations, Net zero energy means we need to reduce energy. So how do we do that? And we come back to what this panel has been talking about today, and not only using that as in, in the weatherization, and weatherization has been a perfect, perfect model for the industry at large, and now it's moving further on. We've been involved with weatherization for 30 years. We know these people. Uh, you, we saw that the previous panel, they're our customers. They're great customers. We try to provide superior service to them because they have new crews. They have somebody who goes out on a site and doesn't know what to do sometimes. They find something that they haven't encountered before and they need some help. We're there to help them. We've been there for 30 years. Uh, we've seen funding obviously fluctuate for many, many years uh, through some of the, the golden times and some of the worst times. We do believe that uh, retaining uh, weatherization funding on a consistent level is an important aspect to this industry. It does help families, it saves energy, and supports the local community. And since this seems to be the video portion of our presentation today, I also have a video. Uh, coming up. Turn the volume down a little bit. This is that music to get you going. I don't see anything up on the screen yet. Go back to the beginning. What we talk about with weatherization, these are the kinds of building defects 
that take place. It affects houses, whether they're made uh, by conscientious builders or those who just don't have a lot of care. But they happen, and they happen to all homes regardless of class. We see these kinds of problems take place. Diagnostic tools that are employed by the uh, various contractor groups um, use them to help identify the problems. In these cases, we're, we're either uh, depressurizing the house or the ductwork, and you're seeing the effects of these building defects where air is moving through the structure. We use a blower door uh, to help with the diagnostics on it. Kind of visualizing a little bit what Mark had um, in a little bit more simplistic manner. The devices are used to help augment what happens in the house. They're used for documenting construction air tightness of buildings. We're estimating the natural infiltration rates. We're doing measures and finding out whether what was done beforehand and after are actually proper. Now, in some portions of the country, we have duct work outside the thermal envelope, and so uh, we have duct leakage uh, testing. This is a way to visualize the problems of a leaky duct in a crawl space. Just marvelous looking picture. Some of these transfer over into the building structure itself. The concept of using an infrared camera to help identify where those building defects are helps crews actually work more efficiently and quicker to get to find where those things are that they need to actually do some work. The process of doing a test is actually just a matter of just a few minutes of setting up. Um, this is the process of putting in a blower door. The test itself is very quick and very simple, but the information that's gathered from that is valuable to both the auditor as well as uh, to the crew and then it, to the auditing process again that verifies the work has been done afterwards. So we're looking to build the pressure in the house to 50 pascals and we identify how much that, uh, how much air is actually moving through the structure. When we're testing ductwork, uh, it's a slightly different process but it's the same principle. We're pressurizing ductwork, we want to find out how much is leaking because the idea is whatever air is moving in has to be coming out. So this is a very um, simple test and here we're going to 25 pascals. Um, and being uniquely American, we're, we're looking at tests where we do 25 pascals and we're measuring cubic feet per minute. Where else in America we mix up metric and English measurements. <laughs> now this is the work that the weatherization crews do. It's not pretty. Some guys actually think this is fun. I don't, but you know there are a lot of guys that, that think it is. They find the problems. The fun part is finding the problems they can fix it, they can, they can do the work, and they enjoy it and they know they've done something good for certainly the homeowner and certainly the community, and they're doing their part to save energy. And the building defects are a variety of things. So uh, with that, I, I thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And again, it's a, a distinct honor to be here and uh, be part of this panel. Thank you. Good morning. It is indeed a pleasure to be here uh, in representing uh, uh, our company that's been working with the weatherization assistance programs for 28 years. I'm a second generation uh, owner. I've been doing this 24 years myself. The company's been around 28 years, but my father who started the company, uh, Bruce Monroe, has been involved with energy auditing uh, for 30 years plus. And looking around, I, I've known a lot of you folks uh, a great deal of time. It's a pleasure to work with you. And we certainly appreciate uh, what you guys do to this market and to these individuals. And it's also helped us to grow and revolutionize the technology that we're using to make things better and faster. So I'm going to go a little bit uh, different as far as the progression of where we are and how we're going. I'm going to make sure everybody understands the benefits of thermography as it applies to weatherization and other energy auditing techniques. And then I'll tell you a little bit about how our company has benefited through these years. So if you don't know, uh, 
infrared imaging technology is non-content, it's non-destructive. We don't want to do any harm to the building that we're looking at. We want to leave it in at least better or certainly no worse shape than it showed up. Uh, one of the benefits is we can inspect during the normal occupancy of the building. This is how the homeowners are living. We want to see that. We want to evaluate a true performance based situation with the energy installed products or not installed products that are there. And infrared technology is one of the easiest ways to do that. One of the other benefits is it's a proactive instead of a reactive testing methodology. We want to make sure we find problems before they become more serious issues within the home. Here's a video uh, I just want to show you uh, recently released and it's going to be uh, of how the cameras are used in the field. That has some energy efficiency issues and show us the latest tools and technologies that he uses to locate air leaks and missing insulation. From the scanning that we see here, this is right over the side door to the exterior. There's some yeah, that's very obvious. Yeah, some significant uh, gaps in the insulation. Uh, now the blower door is on. With the infrared camera, you can really precisely see where you need caulking and more insulation. It's it's very obvious from what we got here. Definitely got air infiltration. Yeah, yeah, exactly where the frame wall structure meets the brick fireplace. There's some air gaps. And that could be a very simple thing to fix. It may be caulking the interior and the exterior that's going to make enough of a difference. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things, Ben and Rob, how many homes do you look at that are in that good shape? <laughs> the other interesting part about that video is it's a very segmented piece of a 10-minute video that was just released towards the end of last year, primarily designed for the home performance industry outside of weatherization. But certainly the methodologies that it's using is based on the success of some of the weatherization programs uh, that are in place for many, many years. I'll give you a little history on why the cameras have not been utilized in infrared and uh, or for weatherization systems program. Look at the image on the left. That is a 25-year-old unit, weighed 40 pounds, cost $50,000, and was considered man-portable. <laughs> Could you imagine trying to walk around, Rob, and other contractors with that type of a unit, trying to crawl up in an attic and do an energy-efficient analysis of a home? Not going to happen. But what happened in the 80s, uh, when we started getting into it and we started seeing the the benefits and we started answering questions from weatherization agencies of why and why not can't we use the technology, we became one of the first companies to work with the manufacturer and integrate the visual along with the infrared portion. Now going to today's market and looking at what we did in the late 80s and early 90s, that's standard features on most infrared cameras and that started because of the need of weatherization asking for a solution to a problem. The one on the right is more typical. Uh, we did start manufacturing our own cameras as an OEM in the early to mid 90s because there was not a camera that fit the weatherization needs. Uh, and those needs were easy to use, rugged, reasonably priced, and we were the first ones to really come up with it. And now uh, manufacturers in the United States are jumping into the bandwagon because of era, because of the need and what's happened is we've facilitated uh, a cost of, of economics that the prices are coming down now. You got the camera on the left that was roughly $50,000. The one on the right that we furnished, first introduced was about $12,000. Today, imagers are down in the two to $5,000 range. Certainly something that can be affordable and applied. So what does that mean to the auditors, to the energy efficiency experts that we have out there in weatherization and beyond? And the estimators, when they go to a house and they're looking at the side of a building, here's a picture of a wall. We can't see anything that's going on, Roland. How are we supposed to estimate what it costs, how long it's going to take to do the job right? With an infrared camera, you can clearly see uh, the scale is dark is cold, white is warm. This is a heating season, so you don't want to see a lot of dark. We can clearly see that this home was attempted to be weatherized before because the insulation is settled, it wasn't applied properly, and now we know that we can only address a certain section of wall area and we can get a more 
accurate estimate. Multifamily units, by far one of the, the lowest hanging fruit that we can capitalize on for saving energy in this country altogether. Whether that's a, a multifamily unit, a low income family unit, it doesn't matter. If we're on the third or fourth store, Rod, Ben, again, same with you, how do we realize where to apply our energy savings measures? Visually, this looks perfectly fine. With a thermal imaging camera, not so. The dark areas are representation of wet spots or moisture because of flashing and window issues. Well, we certainly don't want to go applying energy saving measures like insulation until we fix the leak. So the technology as far as beneficial and applying is a, a wonderful tool. A little bit about us. We're a veteran owned company since my dad started in 84. I'm a veteran as well and he started it with two people. Um, Again, we worked in the late 80s with the manufacturer to really develop technology specifically for the weatherization assistance program. One of the biggest things that we find is, has helped and it's continually to evolve is the training aspect of these tools. <coughs> these tools can only be applied as well as the uh, interpreters and tomographers that are behind the equipment can utilize them. So training programs are coming uh, fast and furious. Uh, last year we first introduced a level one certification program for building analysts, specifically because of the need and the advancement of the technology. Uh, since then, we've grown. We have three offices, uh, eight direct employees that we uh, use to support. We have what we call six dealers that are specifically marketing to weatherization assistance programs and energy efficient companies throughout the United States. We're continually looking to develop more relationships, uh, Rich. And uh, again, we're looking to continue to support the Weatherization Assistance Program with training, with further equipment development, and we are pleased to be here and proud to be a part of this organization for such a long period of time. Thank you very much. I put my name up here. I am no longer Bob. I'm Marcy from Hawkeye Construction. Uh, we're fairly new to the weatherization game. Um, let me tell you a little story about us. It has two themes, optimism and money. <laughs> we might as well talk about money. That's what this is about, right? So uh, in 2009, we had neither optimism or money. <laughs> a big crew. We were um, speculative real estate developers, so we were building houses. There were no more houses to build. We had no more customers. We needed something to do. We found WAP. There was a, an RFP that came across our desk. We thought, you know what? This might be a path to some money. <laughs> so we went for it. Um, we were the first, some of the first contractors in the Baltimore area to jump on board with WAP. Um, and we quickly realized that we needed to buy all new tools and all new equipment. That means that we spent some. Mm -hmm. All right. So we retooled. We got a little bit of caulk. We bought our aerators. We had some cautious optimism. And we went forth. We realized immediately that this was an enormous opportunity for our company. There are weatherization and air quality projects as far as the eye can see. So we had optimism. Here's what we did. We took the work that we were doing with WAP and we went into whole house uh, retrofitting. We started working with the Lead Paint Coalition, um, the local utilities. We wanted to go in to a house, transform it so that on the very next utility cycle, the homeowner saw an enormous, enormous amount of saved money. We started doing um, furnace replacements AC replacement, roof repair, I mean, you name it. Those houses were completely different after we left them than when we got in there. Here's the thing. When we wanted to start doing this whole house approach, we needed to do a lot of training, 200 hours of training per weatherization employee. These aren't managers. This is every person walking through the door. This meant that we spent a lot of money on training. We stimulated the heck out of our community college and out of our training facilities in the greater Baltimore area. They were very excited to see us come. 
We also spent a lot of money. We bought a brand new fleet of trucks. This uh, fleet that you see here, this is our warehouse. Um, you can see how many trucks we have. This is based on $4 million worth of business. Uh, in 2012, we're going to do about $32 million worth of business, so this is going to go, let's say, multiply by 10. Why not? We had to buy all new equipment. We bought some of your equipment, some of your equipment, and a few of your guys, some of your equipment. <laughs> Did you like to get our money? Here's the benefit for manufacturing. Because we are large scale now, because we're doing all these contracts across the spectrum, we can buy in bulk. We can go to the manufacturer and our orders aren't, you know, a little bit of this here and a little bit of that there. It's a regular shipment, a regular full semi-load of equipment every month. So they know how much to produce. We know how much to install. Everybody has an understanding. That helps manufacturing perform more efficiently and it makes us have a better cost efficiency for the work that we're doing. Um, you can see here, these are hot water heaters that we're putting in. You can see we're buying them by the semi-load. This is for a different program. Um, new furnaces, you can see our semi-load of insulation right there. I blurred out the brand name because we don't want to make anybody feel any better than anybody else, but we love you all. <laughs> now here's the other benefit. Uh, here's where we make additional money um, we don't throw anything away. Uh, what we were concerned about with the weatherization program is, you know, we, we change out all of these units, we, we do all this work, are we just taking that and putting it into the landfill? That didn't seem like a really good idea to us. So we figured out how to recycle everything. This is shipping containers. These are the cardboard boxes that everything comes in. It's the packing materials. It's every single unit that we take out of a home. It gets recycled to EPA standards so that um, there's no harm to the environment. We actually sort of create raw materials because we can reuse what we've already dug out of the ground. Um, the benefits here, uh, we haven't really measured, but they're big. So thank you. Thank you for the program. Thanks for inviting me today. Thanks for everything. <laughs>
um, and listening to the debates and hear what, uh, what building designers and engineers are looking at. The weatherization program has been doing this for um, 30 years, almost 30 years, and we've been concentrating on homes. Now when we tar start talking about net zero energy buildings, we're, we have to include commercial buildings. And it's, I see the translation of all the work that's been done um, on the individual basis on the homes translating to the private sector. And the private sector being, purely private sector being big buildings. And that's where they're really, uh, I see that the work that's been done is translating. We're seeing that in, in all of these standards for reduced energy and, and things like that. And, and so, yeah, I would say it has the effect. We haven't seen it. It's tough to calculate. But from my perspective, I'm taking a 30,000 foot view, but that's, that's where I see it. One of my students one time <clears throat> was a facilities manager over all the facilities for a major Fortune 50 company. And we were talking about sick building syndrome. And, his, and I asked him, well, what percent of your buildings, I won't tell you which company it was, have, have had sick building syndrome at one time or another? And his answer was, at one time or another, every commercial building has sick building syndrome. And that's, I think, what you're getting at, aren't you? And we wouldn't understand as much as we do now about sick building syndrome without the benefits of a lot of the technology you see represented here today. Well, and I'll remind you that we, we had talked about the uh, weatherization plus health and that we are working in healthy and trying to create healthy environments now while doing our energy efficiency work. And it's, it's going to make a big difference in people's lives. Bob? Hi. Bob Scott from NASCAS again. Uh, mm -hmm. Training's been a huge part of the weatherization program since its inception and, uh, and, and during the Recovery Act was probably even bigger than throughout the history. Uh, we're probably scaling down our workforce. So I, I wanted to ask Mark, what, what is NSERT's plans for reaching out perhaps to a bigger market now that you've expanded so much and may not have as much weatherization worker training as you did the last few years? That's actually an excellent question, Bob. And I'm going to echo off a lot of what Frank's already talked about with the 2009 International Energy Conservation Code. What we've seen over the last probably six to nine months as municipalities throughout the country um, are starting to implement these, states are starting to mandate these in the coming years. Um, contractors, private contractors, HVAC installers, builders have been contacting training centers just like INSERT uh, for training around air leakage, duct blaster testing, um, so that they can be in compliance um, in the years to come. And you know, recently uh, we actually were contacted by a, a company that actually represents a national firm and they're looking to train about 500 folks over the next six months. Um, so again, this is a, a huge benefit for the training centers um, as R starts to come to an end. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Chant with Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. It's a little bit high. Um, <laughs> there we go. Um, and there have been some game-changing technologies that you represent, the infrared camera and the blower door. They have changed the game. There's another game-changer coming. It's here, and that's smart grid advanced metering devices. Um, Vermont, the state of Vermont, is the recipient of a Department of Energy smart grid investment grant, and Vermont Energy <coughs> Investment Corporation is delighted to be working with the weatherization network in Vermont as a weatherization innovation pilot partner where we are exploring the effects of smart grid introduction into low-income weatherization homes and trying to measure the additional energy saving effects of the, of the smart grid. Um, so we'd just like to thank DOE and the weatherization program and I think the results are going to be very interesting and help build the case for additional savings in this industry that we care so much about. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, George Phelps, Knopf Insulation. And uh, in the spirit of an election year, I'd be happy to debate Chris of National Fiber on the steps <laughs> of the White House, anytime, anyplace. <laughs> Benefits versus features, fiberglass, sailors. There you go. Okay, I'm through with my advertising. <laughs> but uh, 
Bob, I have a question for you. It's a trick question. <laughs> Do you know Jason Barnes? I know the name. That's a good thing because I just had my mother's home weatherized in North Carolina. And the reason I bring up his name and his entire staff, along with the State Energy Office, I was talking to Ward Lenz earlier, and Ernie Hodge was there uh, doing a training session. So this was all going on before my eyes. Being in the installation industry, I have a keen interest in this, obviously. My mother's 90 years old, so it gave her some comfort to know that I was there, especially when they did the blower door test. By doing the blower door test, what they found, by the way, there's no insulation in this house. It was built in the 30s. Were, there was the equivalent of a four and a half foot hole in that house. Right. Now, I don't know about the test out. I'm looking forward to talking to Jason to see what the results of that happen to be. But I've been an advocate for our industry when I worked with the Installation Manufacturers Association for the weatherization program. It's truly a bipartisan program. It's a shame that it has gone in the direction it has in terms of becoming a partisan issue because there are so many people that benefit from this and the entire country benefits from it. So I'd like to commend you guys and Jason in particular. Uh, and Please Jason tell me they did your mother's house well. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell me they did your mother's house well. Uh, well, yes. I'm glad you mentioned that because I had to be at our corporate headquarters, so I called my mom. I said, Mom, how are they doing? She says, they are just so great. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's what we want to hear. 90 years old, that, that tells the story. Thanks so much. Thank you. Can I, can I respond to that? Sure, please. Um, there's actually a study that's been published that shows that the average house, not just a low-income house, but the average house has a hole about the size of a basketball, every single house. So there is weatherization opportunity, not just for low-income, but for all levels of homes and, and businesses. Hi, I'm Dave, Dave Heppenstall from ADA in New York. Um, I just want to first thank uh, everyone for pulling this together today. I think it's so incredibly important. Uh, and the, I remind us that, in fact, nationally, an awful lot of low-income folks live in multifamily housing. And for the first time under ERA, there's been this really huge expansion in the percentage. I guess it's close, it's close to 28% or so of, the, the, of actually the units that have been completed under ERA have been multifamily housing. Correct. And I know in, in New York, Downstate New York, we've completed 38,000 units during this period of time, but it's also meant an expansion to affordable housing nationally in multifamily that has included low rise and high rise, but often central systems. Even, even in places where you have low rise, you may have 400, 600 units and clumps of four or six or eight or 10 with a combination of central systems, complex systems. And affordable housing folks nationally have been able to engage in a way that's never happened before. And I think that partnership has really been quite amazing. And I know that in New York, the challenge has been, historically, we've not had enough money to do big complexes. I mean, we've done, yesterday we had an opening of a sort of a ribbon cutting on, on an event in New York City where it's a 350 unit complex that's affordable housing that had two huge steam boilers replaced by five hydronic systems in the last year demonstrated 40% savings since the installation of those systems. We could never touch projects of that size. We've done 900 unit projects. We've done huge projects that are never possible before, and that includes, I believe, around the country. So one of the challenges, it seems to me, that we face is as the technology, the wireless technology we've been using in terms of controls, as all of this we've learned and affordable housing partnership has happened, how can we get to scale with this huge funding cut we've had, even going back to what we once had, okay, is a, is a challenge, how we're gonna maintain the leveraging infrastructure we've had in place and the expansion of multifamily that have been so necessary, how do we maintain that success? So they're challenged. That's a good question. And I would love to hear some, something from, them, from this group, including Bob, as to ideas of how we can work together to ensure we meet that challenge. You do know I work for the U.S. Department of Energy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody from the panel like to, would like to answer that? I guess I can reiterate from the state of Washington that we certainly saw an increase in the number of multifamily units being served. Um, prior to our 60% uh, of the households served were single family. 
and the percentage flipped during our, uh, uh, we served over 13,000 families under ARA. And 60% of those families lived in uh, what, uh, multifamily units. We've had discussion because of the reduction in ARA, because of, particularly with the large multifamily buildings, that the opportunity to serve that many households that reside in a multifamily building are going to become very difficult because the amount of funding that's available and the upfront cost that's required to cover that uh, size of building is going to be impossible for many of the community action agencies that are administering the program. And we do considerable leveraging in our state with utilities and other funding streams and the challenge is certainly going to be there. We're also working, we're putting together uh, workforce uh, guidelines uh, for the work for the professionals who are working in multifamily. We're also developing a, a new multifamily audit tool that will be available to auditors. It's an investment grade tool that will help hopefully drive down the cost of at least the, the auditing and, and upfront uh, expenses in, in accessing multifamily. But your point's well made. 50% of low income families live in multifamily buildings. It's a building stock we need to continue to address. And it is an expensive, sometimes a very expensive investment being made by public dollars and private dollars to get where we need to go. We understand your problem. We, have, uh, we understand the issue. Um, I'm not the one that's going to get to vote on how much money the weatherization program gets. Okay, now, uh, good morning, still. My name is Jay Murdoch with Efficiency First. Um, uh, with Efficiency First, is the mic on? Okay. Uh, my members are co contractors doing home performance retrofits, doing energy audits, they're insulation contractors, HVAC contractors, HERS raters, uh, community action group suppliers and manufacturers. Um, uh, yeah, I think it was uh, in the early 70s when I was dragged by my grandfather uh, to go do weatherization in Newark, New Jersey, that I decided I wanted to go to architecture school so, um, <laughs> and, and, and get out of the construction trades. But, um, you know, one of the things, we've got some great examples here from Hawkeye and other panelists where there's clearly a, a, a private partner, private public partnership between a community action agency and the private sector. So I'm wondering if there's a way going forward uh, to codify that uh, through guidance or um, uh, direction to the community action agencies in the states to try to amplify and magnify those kind of partnerships. Uh, because I, I have to be candid, some of my members felt like they were on the sidelines watching a lot of this work in the past couple of years. And, and some, some folks are very well qualified. So a, a challenge to the department and the industry to try to uh, find if there's a way to build a, a better, stronger bridge. Thank you. Thank if you. I, may I respond to that? Sure, please. Uh, we found that it's all about the network. It's about networking. Your, your, your members have got to get into the room where the other people are, where, they're, where the community liaisons are. It's that discussion, it's a dialogue. It's not necessarily just an RFP process. It's getting to know people, it's a human interaction. If you can facilitate that as part of your mission, that, you know, that's gonna really move this forward. We also had, uh, during our, we, uh, actually during 2010, we were, Congress provided us with funds to look at innovative ways in which to deliver the service. And we are looking at other non-traditional uh, partners that, that are providing weatherization services around the country. That project is still underway. There's been no evaluation as to the cost benefits of that. But we, we all already recognize that, that there is an opportunity for other partnerships. John Dooley with Advanced Energy. Uh, this, uh, this is the, uh, I can't thank you enough for this meeting. And the need to actually illuminate and, and the entire nation as to the work that has been done. Uh, I bought my blower door in 1985 and there was only one blower door in all the east, southeast. <laughs> I bought an infrared camera the same day, and uh, it, it was pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to kind of try to get all of us to think about, and then I'm going to pose the question, is that it takes three things to grow an oak tree. It takes an acorn, water, and soil. 
excuse me, four, and sunlight. <laughs> this is the sunlight. Uh, since I came into the industry, uh, I actually never knew this industry existed. And I went to Affordable Comfort Conference and found out at that conference there were 700 people there that their heart was into helping people. I didn't know that there was other people like me. <laughs> I, I thought I was the only one. This past year, there was the largest acorn drop on my land that I've ever seen. But I also know that only a few will become oak trees, not all of them. And I've watched over the years the weatherization program from the, its infancy, where most of us, uh, we, we, a couple of us were elbowing each other when, when Mr. Williams talked about CETA. <laughs> and some of us in the room, you know, like you just you've heard about that. But the fertile ground of weatherization, not the private sector, is what has brought forth growth that the private sector can use forever. The 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 technologies have changed drastically, not because of the private sector but because of the fertile ground and the desire to serve and do work that actually works. And I've watched that grow over the years. I listened to this panel, I listened to the previous one. You'd have to be dead in this room to have not listened to Mr. Williams and almost had tears come to your eyes in the pictures he showed. That's the fertile ground. That's where blower doors and infrared cameras and manometers and monoxers and the, 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 the networking that you talk about. It came from this fertile ground. My question is, is I want to go back on Monday morning, and I, as a, is including us all, I want to go back on Monday morning and begin to figure out in a broad spectrum nationally how do we bring sunlight upon this particular industry and make it happen. How can we do that? How can we do training? How can we increase your sales and, and production of good, good uh, equipment and the networking so that all this wonderful work, even though the funds are going down, we illuminate it up. Hmm. That's a good question. Our closing speakers here, how, quick, how quickly is your question? We can't answer that one right now. I think the answer is in the room, though. Um, how quick is your question, Rick? Okay. Actually, um, ditto on what John Yeah, well. <laughs> uh, and uh, my, my um, connection to the weather station program goes back to 19, 1983. So I'm kind of aging myself here. Um, at that point, I actually. Uh, ran a local weatherization program. Uh, on set of circumstances, became the state weatherization director in New York for 14 years. And, and after I left, that was um, asked to go over to the New York State resident, uh, uh, New York State um, Research uh, and Development Authority, and to create a, uh, a residential deployment capacity there. Uh, and uh, when um, when we thought about it, we said, let's just take the best practices of the weatherization program and let's call it something. And we called it Home Performance. Met with uh, uh, EPA back then, was able to use the term Energy Star. And thus, Home Performance with Energy Star was born, uh, born of, of the weatherization parent. And um, the point is that that industry that is now solid and exists nationally. Uh, is because of the weatherization program, which I contend is the best national program, federal program ever created because of its concept. <laughs> to, have, to have anecdotes used out of context to hurt it, uh, we cannot allow that to happen. And I think each of us has to take a personal commitment to coming back and uh, being a part 
of what, what I'm hoping advocates and NASCAS will provide for us, and that is a way and a means for us to enlighten our congressional friends. So um, uh, uh, just uh, thank you all. This is really good, Bob. Thank you. And thank you, Brad. Thank you, advocates. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Please let me, uh, please give our, our panel one more hand for that great work. Thank you very much. Um, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Chair Nancy Sutley. She's the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. In her role as chair, Nancy serves as the principal, principal environmental policy advisor to the president and helps coordinate federal environmental efforts while working closely with agencies and other White House, and White House offices in the development of environmental policies and initiatives. Nancy has a remarkable resume if you ever get a chance to see it. Some of her previous roles include serving as Deputy Mayor for Energy and Environment for the City of Los Angeles. That's in California in case you didn't know. Uh, she also worked for, for Governor Gray as an energy advisor. She's worked as a deputy secretary for policy and, and intergovernment relations in California EPA. She's also served EPA as a senior policy advisor to, in the regional office in San Francisco under President Clinton. She has been a tremendous advocate for all, and all environmental quality around the country and a strong supporter of the weatherization program. It's my pleasure to introduce Chair Nancy Sutton. Thank you so much uh, for that nice introduction, and uh, and I hello and thank you to all of you. I know uh, I'm I guess the last speaker that I'm standing between you and lunch, um, but I know you've been having a great session all morning, and we're very grateful uh, that you're here and grateful for all the work that you uh, do every day in your communities. And I think this is uh, a great opportunity for this group, along with. Uh, folks in the administration to really um, spend a day talking about uh, the important uh, and very positive economic impacts that home retrofits have on communities uh, across the country. And I want to thank the National Association of for State Community Service Programs for helping to organize this event for all of you uh, for being here. You know, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, I really allowed the administration to make uh, what is a, as you know, an unprecedented commitment to expanding uh, home energy efficiency and retrofits and the markets and the business opportunities and the benefits associated with them. And I think uh, the benefits of weatherization um, to this audience and I think to everyone should be very clear. Uh, opportunities. Uh, for workers, uh, not only to get trained uh, with new skills, uh, but to uh, find work, incentives uh, for companies uh, to create new jobs, uh, and certainly benefits to the families um, who save uh, money on their energy bills. And it's very exciting that uh, using this Recovery Act funding, uh, the Department of Energy and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and working with all of you and your colleagues across the country that have been able to retrofit more than a million homes, and that's um, remarkable. Supporting uh, more than 14,000 direct jobs and saving families more than $350 million a year in the energy bill. So that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good investment and a, and a pretty uh, good track record. On average, as you know, each weatherized home sees a drop of more than 400 and $35 a year in their energy bills. And we know that low-income households in particular spend a disproportionate amount of their income on home energy bills. So these savings can have a really profound impact on the ability of families uh, to manage their household budgets. And we know that the benefits also translate across the supply chain and you see the impact on your businesses and in your communities. And this is really part of the action uh, that uh, many of you have been involved with for a long time, but that uh, the administration has really tried to focus on and highlight 
to encourage energy efficiency efforts in jobs across the country. And I know you've heard about some of those initiatives today. For example, the administration has par partnered with the utility industry and challenged them to make it easier for their customers to get secure online access to their own household or building energy use data through a user-friendly green button. And we've heard this from the utilities themselves, that in putting customers in control of their own energy data, uh, they're making decisions. They're making decisions about managing uh, or upgrading their house or their building uh, and working on the energy performance. And the utilities that have signed up for a green button have committed to providing this information to more than uh, 31 million households and businesses across the country. To help consumers gain uh, better access, uh, access to better information about their own home's energy use, the Department of Energy has created the Home Energy Score, which is a quick and credible way uh, that you can rate the energy performance of a home, something like uh, the, a vehicle's miles per gallon rating. And the Department of Energy uh, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development and Department of Agriculture are all uh, working to help uh, consumers get access to affordable financing to pay for energy efficiency improvements, uh, in including through the power saver loans from the Federal Housing Administration, uh, state revolving loan funds, uh, and an energy efficiency loan and grant program that's targeted at the customers of rural electric cooperatives. And to help uh, consumers find, uh, easily find and identify well-trained and reliable home retrofit workers, the Department of Energy, working with industry stakeholders, is developing guidelines for home energy professionals to support and promote <coughs> high quality home energy upgrades. Uh, EPA's healthy indoor environment protocols for home energy upgrades are a great companion to this guideline and, and help give people the confidence that home energy uh, efficiency Im improvements uh, will maintain a good indoor air quality and health uh, for the residents. And the Small Business Administration is developing online courses to train businesses who are looking to enter the home energy retrofit market. Other administration programs are working to identify innovative ways to develop, uh, to, to further the development of the home energy retrofit market. Uh, DOE's Better Buildings Neighborhood Program is devoting more than $500 million uh, for more than uh, 40 state and local governments to identify dozens of sustainable home retrofit business models that can be replicated in communities across the United States. And so this is, um, this is just a sampling of the things that we're working with, working on, but working with all of you. I, I think that we can ensure that these kinds of smart programs and programs like this uh, at all levels uh, of government and across communities will help uh, to continue to support jobs and businesses uh, and energy savings and healthy communities across the country. So, uh, we are just so delighted that you're here at the White House today uh, because you're the people who are really making this happen and making this happen for uh, millions of Americans and in more than a million households. And we just, I just want to take a moment to thank you for uh, everything that you're doing, for all the hard work, uh, for all your patience, uh, for all the innovation, and for really getting, getting the job done. Um, we are here to be your partner. Uh, and we will continue to do everything that we can to support you. And together, we'll continue to, to pursue a, a healthy and a prosperous uh, future for, uh, for all Americans. So thank you again for being here, and uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, I, I wish you all the best uh, in the remaining time we have. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming today. That, that concludes our, our event. I look forward to hearing from all of you uh, as you go back to your states and, and communicate what you learned today. Thanks so much.